Hello, I'm Allegra Madsen, the Program Director at Frameline, and welcome to Frameline 45. Thank you so much for joining us for our Frameline Talks panel, Sugar in My Bowl, African American Representation in Queer Media. I am particularly excited for this panel because finding ways to uplift Black queer stories is my personal, personal passion and one of my primary missions here at Frameline. Uh, today, I am joined by the amazing Variety reporter and our moderator for the day, Angelique Jackson. Hi, Allegra. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be a part of this panel, to be a part of the film festival, and also to get a chance to discuss the work of these incredible filmmakers and creators. So we'll just kind of get right to it. Joining me for this panel are Elegance Bratton, director, writer, and producer. Hi. Hi. We have Nathan Hale Williams, filmmaker and president and CEO of Inhale Entertainment. Hey there, Angelique. Hi. We have Brittany Nichols, writer, comedian, and actor. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi. We have Kat Black, animator, illustrator, and YouTube star. Hi there. Hi. We have Clay Kane, journalist, author, political commentator, radio host of Sirius XM's Urban View, and filmmaker. Hello. Hi. And last but not least, we have Maisie Richardson Sellers, director, advocate, founder of Bareface Productions, and actor. So good to be here with you all. Well, thank you all so much for being here. It, this is such an amazing panel also because while you guys are all filmmakers and creators, you also have very distinct viewpoints and entrances into this industry to really kind of give us this scope of what we are kind of here to discuss today, what the state of the industry is for content creators who are queer and black. There is, you know, a lot of intersectionality kind of gets missed when we have a lot of these conversations. So I guess that's where I would like to start. You know, how can we get Hollywood gatekeepers to better understand the concept of intersectionality when it comes to representation in the industry and that kind of starting line of, you know, we have, we're having all these conversations about we need to be more inclusive, but it feels like sometimes it's missed exactly what inclusive looks like. Um, you know, Elegance, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. You know, we met recently with Peer Kids, and it's been, it's been of course, congratulations, the, the critical acclaim for the film. But what have you seen um, this year in particular in the industry and, and how we're looking at inclusion and representation? I think um, one of the things that happened is that we need to, uh, that's my cat's play tower in the background, by the way. Um, you know, I think one of the things we need to do is, we need to start looking at who's saying the words inclusion and diversity and ask ourselves, are those individuals representative of inclusion and diversity? I've been in a lot of rooms this year, gratefully working with some incredible allies. However, I've yet to see a lot of you know representation of you know black queer people, black people, women. I, you know, I, I'm still find myself talking to predominantly white gatekeepers. And while you know this COVID situation and you know, the, the death in, of George Floyd and the subsequent trial, I think is kind of shaking people out of the doldrums and forced them to reconcile with a very different future for this industry. You know, it's like turning around a, a, a 20 ton truck. It, it, as, as soon as the, I, the notion is had, it takes a lot of kind of different mechanisms to, to actually change the thing. So I'm hoping that as we go forward, we have more diversity and inclusion in the roles of the gatekeepers themselves. Yeah. With uh, with you guys in general, and you know, a lot of you have taken that role into your own hands and in founding production companies and, and, and really taking some of the power, but at the same time, again, there's still that gatekeeper role. So Nathan, for you, and then Maisie, I, I'd like to pitch it over to you both as, as founders and, and heads of your, your production banners. Um, how have you seen the state of the industry when you go in those rooms and those meeting spaces? Well, you know, I think this is a great question. I just want to piggyback on what Elegance said. Um, having been on both sides, I'm uh, an entertainment lawyer and I've been practicing entertainment law for 21 years. And so I've been in the room as as that. And then I've also, I'm not also a filmmaker and a writer, director, and producer. Um, piggybacking on what Elegance said, we need to change the, the gatekeepers, the people that are picking the stories that are shown and that are highlighted. Um, we need to have more inclusion and diversity in those ranks 
ranks. And the people that run these companies, the CEOs, the executives, need to make a concerted effort to make sure that the people that are doing the development represent a broad range of audience. Um, because a lot of it, you know, is also just indicative of human nature. You're attracted to things that you know. You're attracted to things that you like. You're attracted to things that resonate with you. I, I, I recent the film that I have in Frameline called All Boys Aren't Blue. I presented it to an organization as a part of a program, and um, there were, you know, white LGBT uh, QIA members that said the film didn't resonate with them. Well, it's about black queer men, but there's some universal universality in the film itself. So it's also just talking about making sure the people that are looking at the projects, looking at the content, the gatekeepers themselves are diverse and inclusive. On the other side of that is also using the resources that we have now in the digital age to create our own. Um, we all know that financing usually is the biggest barrier to production for most people. Um, and so I always, any chance I get, I just try to encourage people when you see someone like an Elegance, like a Nathan, like any of these filmmakers that are on the panel do a go fund me or, or ask for money, give $5, give $10, give $30 if you can, because financing is usually the biggest barrier. Absolutely. Maisie, what has the experience been like for you? 100%. I completely agree with all of that. I think it's interesting having come from the acting's perspective first, because I started noticing that I was often telling stories which were becoming more inclusive on the screen, but they were still being written, directed, produced by people who had no direct experience of those of those of life um, as a as a queer person as a person of color um, and I got so frustrated by trying to basically having to be the representative for the story rather than it being a collaborative experience and having to check people and correct things and having scripts sent to me to look over I'm like how are you such a huge organization and you don't have enough people within your own organization to to share this with um, so Again, I think it comes hugely down to the gatekeepers. I think it comes hugely down to trickle down effect, but I also think it needs to be a concerted effort to bring people in at every single level and train them because we don't have the same access. We don't have the same educational access, the same options in order to even know that this is a possibility for us to go into the arts um, in such a diverse range of roles. Um, and I, you know, the reason why I founded Bareface Productions was because I was, I was tired. I was tired of creating in a homogenous space. So one of our key things with Bare Face Productions is that we try and make sure that 80% of all of our crews are POC as well, um, because I think that creates nuanced storytelling where people can relate to the experience and it can be a collaborative experience. Um, so for my short film, you know, every single department head was a woman of color because the story was about a woman of color, queer woman of color. Um, and we had 80% POC crew and it created such an amazing electric environment. Um, and I just really, really hope people see the value of that and the value of diverse experiences going forward and start really making an effort to diversify at every single level. May, or Brittany, for you, in, in what Maisie was just speaking about, that idea of a lot of these roles that are being you know, performed by actors like the two of you are not uh, written by people that look or have experienced anything like you have. But Brittany, on, on your case, you are a, a writer, a comedian, and I, I, we've gotten to know a lot of your work from uh, the things you've done behind the scenes. How have you seen that landscape change over these last few years? I, you know, I haven't been going out for acting roles in a while, so I'm not sure how much it changed, but when I was first starting out, it certainly was what I would describe as a hostile environment. Um, people just were throwing things down and just throwing people at roles with no real understanding of what those identities meant. Um, so, you know, I had experiences going in for trans women. I had experiences going in for uh, being asked to come in for trans men, which I wouldn't go in for. Uh, and people just sort of were like, I don't know, you're sort of in this bucket. So you maybe. Um, and what's frustrating about that experience is, you know, a lot of these times, now that they are starting to cast more queer people, more non-binary people, it's still a lane. It's still a certain subset of these identities that are now sort of being chosen as like, okay, and that fit the, the role of what an actor is supposed to look like enough. And that comes with like body diversity, that comes with uh, masculine presenting folks. Like 
it, there are still so many boundaries to be broken down and so much diversity behind the scenes necessary to inform these sorts of decisions. How has the landscape changed as a writer? And have, you know, in the openness to people telling these kinds of stories, in getting staffed, things along those lines, how, how have you seen the shifts? I've seen the shift in how people talk in meetings. It's a lot of, I'm telling you that I care. I'm telling you this is something I'm passionate about. And it's like, uh, well, don't tell me, show me. Like, hire these people, make these shows. We don't need 20 people having general meetings about this stuff. We need 20 shows of different tone and genre and experience level and life experience. Like, it's not enough to just tell us that now your mind has been opened if it's not gonna result in a finished product of our stories and our faces and our voices on the screen. Absolutely. And, you know, Kat, with you, with having, you know, in, in your work, both as, you know, an animator and an illustrator, that's a little bit more of, of being in those spaces. But then as a YouTuber, you're, you have the, that side where you're in control of what the content looks like and really just in that two-way communication with your audience. How have you seen this last year and one, both what the audience is interested in, in discussing with you, but also what you've kind of observed about the landscape of, of both of your industries? Oh, God. <clears throat> so, I mean, in this last year, I think we've had a lot of um, growth. Like there's it, it was kind of a, a renaissance for me, at least a creative renaissance. Um, because a lot of us had to like rethink how we were working and what we were doing. And, you know, with the world shutting down, I actually had more of an ability to focus on my channel and to really like up my production and just like start creating better stuff. Um, and I probably wouldn't have had the extra time if we weren't forced to, you know, hunker down and be inside and, and focus on our stuff. And so, um, I grew a lot in that way, in that respect, and I now am able to do so much more, um, you know, now that I have that I have been before the pandemic in terms of what I create. Um, but yeah, grew a lot in that way, and then a lot of people grew on Patreon. Like community support for me um, is like a really big important part of um, people being able to create the thing that they care about for a living because I do yeah. everything I can do because of Patreon and because of things like that and Patreon and stuff like that grew quite a bit over the past year. And so many more people are creating stuff they care about. Yeah. Have you noticed the conversation with the audience changing in this last year? Uh, um, yeah, I get, I think some people, um, well, at least so for my audience, at least, um, I know people were, they didn't want to be constantly reminded of the things that we all knew were already happening. We all had like a lot of time to sit and like, be reminded of like everything that happened in the news and every sad story. So there's a lot of escape people wanting more escapism during this time than, than before. So I actually started doing like movie reviews and things instead of just like talking about the issues. Um, and I thought that that kind of was effective because people wanted to disconnect, I think a little bit from the real world. Yeah. Yeah. And Clay, for you, of course, you are a film filmmaker, but you also do come to a lot of the angles and perspectives on this it's kind of similarly to me as a commentator, as a reporter, you know, both living and working through things, but also having to, you know, kind of dissect it and, and funnel it back to people. How have you seen um, and, and kind of worked through the industry changes of the last year? What what has been the state of the industry for you? Yeah, I mean, I come at it from a journalist and a documentary perspective. And I will say that I've seen some changes here or there, but I think the most important change that I've seen is when it comes to the gatekeepers is to acknowledge and know the gatekeepers don't give a fuck about you. So mm -hmm. you really have to be your own content creator. They will mm -hmm. never care about you. Begging for access, for, begging for access to them hoping they'll, they'll let you in the door, whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, I've been in so, Nathan Hale Williams, the work that he's done for such a long time, you have to really, really fight to say, do I really care about those gatekeepers? And I, I get it from, a, from a, a money perspective and finance, but at the end of the day, they don't care about you. And there is a certain element 
of having to sell your soul. Not for everybody, but there's a certain element where they want you to tap dance. So at this point in my career, uh, I'm, I'm just not concerned with that, or concerned with that. I want to make the work. I want to do the work. I want to give. I want to tell stories that aren't being told. Uh, but I can no longer uh, focus or ask or or uh, wonder if the gatekeepers are going to one day get it because it's a story as old as time. Uh, and the the, the 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 content creators that I most admire, they managed to carve something out for themselves, and then the audience came to them. And then the quote unquote gatekeepers came to them. I know some people who said no to the gatekeepers after that. Well, I don't want you. I don't want you now. So I did my own thing. In 2021, we really have to be, we have to own our own content, own our own work, ownership, because giving over your rights, I mean, the rights of your work and begging for them to see it, I think it's very, very difficult. I know so many people that have just been so hurt and bruised by this industry because they thought having that mainstream deal was important or having that gatekeeper receive them was, was important. But I think we're seeing now uh, there's ways to go around it. There's, you know, I want work that is subversive and radical and, and, and provocative. And that just isn't the kind of work, um, at least from the kind of work that I do, that the quote unquote gatekeeper is going to is going to absorb. I mean, just keep it all the way real. I appreciate it because it's true. We you know, I think we have had a great as much as the industry itself has had a great reckoning. I do feel like for me, at least as, as a black person in this industry, I've had my own personal reckoning and understanding of, you know, it's, it's just going to be what it is. And we do have to focus on our own ownership and our own work as creators and just making things happen. You know, for all of you, have you found yourself being more or less creative during this time? Have you kind of found that, you know, being more energized with this period? Um, Clay, I'll, I'll, I'll actually start with you on that one. Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I work from home for the most part, so it hasn't been that different for me. I know some people uh, went through a little bit of uh, trauma during COVID. I didn't. I'm fine not seeing people, but that's just me. Uh, so, so really, what it was able to do, uh, I was able to foster more connections. People that I knew who were always on the run, uh, who were always running around, I was able to really connect with them more. So, although I wish this never happened, and I actually had COVID, I wish it never happened. It's such a heartbreaking thing in the way that it happened. But I, I find that um, I want to, I want to keep the momentum going. I was able to do that during COVID. And I also want to make, I also would hope that people that I know who are going back out into that hectic space that I hope they're not going back into exploitation, whether it's exploitation mm -hmm. of your art, of your work. Uh, that's what I hope we're not going to return to. So I've been able to get some amazing work done. Uh, I've, I've, I've been able to be, be productive. And I just hope that for others, uh, it's not back to that, that grind that's sometimes endless and uh, can really suck your soul dry. Yes, yes. Um, Nathan, for you, obviously your film, All Boys Aren't Blue, is at, at Frameline this year. Um, when it comes to your work and your art, have you found yourself you know, wanting to be more creative during this period? Or uh, how, how, how are, yes, how has, that, how has that been for you right now? So for me, the creativity saved me. It was my it was my disconnect from what was going on in the world. I I wrote my tail off. Um, you know, I worked six days a week, and that was my distraction from what was really going on in the world. And I also use it as as Clay says. I usually work from home anyway, but I make a, a good portion of of my income from speaking and being on the road and being on airplanes. And so I got to sit down and actually sit and write. And I wrote. A, I finished a book. Um, I finished three scripts. Um, we actually shot All Boys Aren't Blue uh, in January of this year in the height of the you know resurgence of the pandemic, which I would not recommend to anyone. Um, but uh, it, for me, it was a creative boom. And uh, but I also had, you know, kind of the tools and the mechanisms to deal with the mental side of it. And then my mom also quarantined with me and I have my dog. And so I was surrounded by love and lots of Tito's. But yeah, for me, uh, mm -hmm. It was a creative boom because I actually got time to not have to deal with getting on airplanes and deal with other people. And um, and now it's time just to roll out what I created during the pandemic. 
when it comes to creating during the pandemic and when it came come, came to filming this during you know this like you said this very difficult period of our lives you know did you find it i know you said it you felt like it it, it saved you a bit but what was it about creating that was so cathartic what was it about creating especially this piece that was so cathartic well with with this particular piece um it really was a cathartic kind of um elevating moment i had just finished george's wonderful memoir and i said to myself i have to get in touch with them to let them know what it meant to me. And it was in November. And then almost the very next day, I got a call from Amara Kennedy at uh, AHF Black and George saying that they wanted to do some kind of staged reading of it. And then they gave me free reign to make it into a film. And so um, so for me, it was it was kind of this, you know, coming out of this really, really dark time with something really beautiful and affirming for black queer men and just black pe black queer people in general. And so, um, it, you know, the difficulty came and we had to be COVID tested. Like I felt like they were up my nose like 25 times for the one little day shoot. But um, so that was nerve wracking. But the actual production of the film was just a beautiful moment that capped off a really, really crazy time. Yeah. Maisie and Elegance, I know you both are in varying stages of productions on, on multiple projects. How have you found your creativity during this period? Uh, Maisie, I'll start with you. Yeah, at first I really struggled with it. I, I realized I've been on the go for a long time and I found it really hard to be still. Um, so I retreated and watched, you know, watched a lot of films and TV and kind of just caught up both old, old stuff um, and current stuff, all the stuff that I've been, you know, putting off, hadn't had the time. Um, and then I found this amazing desire to just create with what I had around me. So me and my, my partner, she's a amazing musician um, and we started just making music videos exploring mental health and isolation just everything with our phone editing it on our computer and just putting it out there um, and that was really nice to remember just how easy it can be how stripped back it can be and how you can still find um, ways to connect with people and to move people without without all the glam and the gloss on it um, so I started writing a lot um, and then at the end, about just got back three weeks ago from directing my first episode of TV on Legends of Tomorrow, which was amazing. Um, and I feel very, very blessed to be able to direct during this time. Um, and, you know, there was one time, you know, when I joined the show, there was two people of color in, in the main cast. And then, and I was only a new woman of color and we didn't have any directors of color for the first season that I was there. And then, you know, now, to be able to be there as the first woman of color director in over 80 episodes that they've had. Um, and there was one scene we did where all four of the actors that were people of color. And I was just like, you know, we are making progress. And that was really beautiful to see. And that kind of felt um, very, very cathartic for me as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you're, you're going home a bit, you know, it's people you all know and it's, it's crew and, but it's also like, how was it? Uh, how was it being in that space? You know, obviously it's, it's somewhere that you're used to being as an actor, but to be, you know, standing in that power as the director. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting to use the word power because it was so humbling, like, you know, just to see the crew working from the other perspective and to be in the trenches with them. And, you know, we were filming till 5 a.m. in the middle of the forest, three nights in a row. And it was just so beautiful watching them rally. Um, and just experts, experts, and how as long as you lean on, like listen to them, people have amazing ideas as long as they feel like it's safe to present them. You know, you're not the totalitarian leader. You don't know everything. I'm, I am new at this. And so really finding that dynamic of maintaining the integrity of my vision, but then also making it a collaborative process was amazing. Elegance, over to you with, with your creativity during this period, how have you found it? Um, it's been a really uh, fertile period, I, I think, you know, people who know me know, you know, I, I've, COVID-19 is just the latest calamity in my life. So in a way I've been living on COVID-19 since I, I left home at the age of 16. So, you know, creating in crisis and trauma is somewhat old hat for me. Uh, not suffice it to say, it's been a year of incredible growth for me professionally. Um, I shot a feature length documentary called Hellfighter which is about James Reese Europe, the first black composer to headline a show at Carnegie Hall. Um, we shot that last summer, uh, summer 2020. Additionally, I uh, shot an episode of Disney Plus television show that I can't talk about just yet, but it will be out next year. I just shot that like maybe like last month. 
and I'm in pre-production on the inspection in my fiction debut film. And in the background of that, you know, Pierre Kids got picked up for distribution by uh, POV on PBS. So I've been pretty productive during this period. I, you know, I, uh, the short that I did, Buck, that's been picked up for series um, at another, you know, major studio that I can't say right now. So it's been really, really fruitful. I, I've, I've, in a way, I kind of felt like this year the world caught up to what I had been living in. Like I've kind of been in a place of anger and sadness over the loss of my mom this year. And the COVID crisis made it so that whenever I was anywhere, people were in some ways dealing with their own anger and sadness and um, having these creative outlets and you know the financial stability they provided has been, and having my husband and creative partner Chester be a part of this with me has been, you know, um, pivotal. I, I don't know, as, 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 as successful as it, it's been, the best part is having that, like Nathan said, that love at home and that support at home and um, the permission to say that things are not okay out loud, you know, for once. Yeah. That's been liberating. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think in general, and Clay kind of mentioned this as well, that, you know, even though we were very isolated, this was a time because we were all kind of shut down that we had a chances to to reform and, and form some community that we necessarily were kind of, you know, buzzing around all the time and not really making the time and space for. Um, Elegance also, I wanted to ask you about having uh, peer kids on PBS, on POV. When it comes to having these queer narratives in, you know, quote unquote, mainstream media, how important is it to have a distribution platform like that for this film? For me, it was essential. I grew up watching uh, public television because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I, I remember when we got cable and it was felt like we were the last people on our block to get cable. So PBS and you know the kind of main networks were my um, main way of coming across any sort of glimpse of anything that looked like me on television. So from, you know, as my 13 year old self is looking at my not 13 year old self today and just being like, whoa, man, we did it. We're on PBS, you know? Um, in terms of like the general kind of scope of my career, you know, I've kind of done it a little bit of both. Like what Clay was saying, you know, I, I definitely went out and I made my own stuff and kind of was, at times it felt like I was making it in a vacuum until I would go to a festival and I'd meet the audience for the stuff. And slowly but surely we started to build a little collective. And then once that happened, you know, it felt like the industry started paying attention to what I was doing. And then I started to get opportunities within, you know, the actual, the business, you know, there's like the stuff you do. And then there's like Luke, John, Mark and Rob and Mike and Sean and, <laughs> you know, all those people that kind of are between your idea and potentially your audience. And, yeah. you know, so I've been, I've kind of had it both ways. And I think for me, distribution at the highest level, like I want to talk to my, I'm a mass cultural kind of guy. I want to talk to America at large. I want to talk about the global meaning of blackness and anti-blackness. I want to talk about the military, military industrial complex. These are things I want to talk about. These are big, ticket issues. And I feel like, you know, I want to talk to millions of people at a time. I, I'm not, I, I respect the idea of building that audience one by one, but I am very grateful for the amplification that I've been able to eke out. But it is a dance, you know, it is a political kind of dance. And I often joke with, with Chester, you know, my partner, like, you know, sometimes it feels like we're in an episode of House of Cards and we're constantly negotiating, you know, that the, not only speaking truth to power, but to what effect. But for me, you know, I grew up watching mainstream movies and mainstream television, and I feel like there needs to be more of me in those spaces. So I want the biggest platforms possible to put these stories on. How have you all found that navigation that because as as uh, for me, I, you know, I'm I'm here as an ally, as a as a black straight woman. So I have found my navigation to be particularly uh, tricky and difficult a in its own ways. Black straight woman, gorgeous black Thank straight you. woman, smart. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I, I will say that in this conversation, there is an element to you know each one of your individual perspectives that I don't know. 
And I'm, I'm so glad to be able to have this conversation and understand a little bit more of the nuances of navigating these spaces. Um, and, and the reason I ask you about that too is because I know how few media narratives there were for me growing up. And I know there are even less uh, for all of you and also considerably still less. So I'm curious, what were some of the, as you were figuring out where to be in this industry and are still figuring out where to be in this industry, how did the media narratives that you consumed about queer people affect the content that you make and those specific gaps that you knew only your voice could fill and, and as you figured out how to fill them? I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna, yes, please. I'm just gonna jump in because I talked about, I just talked about this the other day. Like In my mind, what I'm doing, every time I sit down to write something, I'm asking myself, you know, what is it that I'm bringing to this story that the audience could never have if I wasn't taking them there, right? I view myself as, um, you know, some form of, of almost I, somewhere, something between a tour guide and a griot, you know, like I, I'm exploring my kind of outsider identity through my work and trying to make peace with the trauma that's caused me, while at the same time trying to cast a mirror on the audience so that they can see their role and their complicity in forming the very notion of what is outside versus what is inside. So when it comes down to it, I think, you know, it's important to me to just be conscious of the fact of like, I want to take the audience to a place that could never go unless it was me taking them there. And so that's kind of the, the principle out of which I operate amongst others, you know, like for me, God fears sex is kind of like, my personal um, creative ethos. I feel like the best work does all three. And I'm always trying to get at least two of them on the board whenever I make something. Kat, how, oh, Nathan, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Um, just to piggyback on what Elegant said, you know, growing up, um, the black gay character, if you remember like Revenge of the Nerds and all those, I mean, you know, that I'm an 80s, 90s, you know, person. And so they was always, they were always a fop. They were always, you know, they they were always the afterthought. They were always, you know, the 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 character that was the butt of the joke. And growing up, I was like, that's not my existence. You know what I mean? That's not who I am. And so, you know, although there's a lot of message in, embedded in my in my work, I really actually also want to make sure that I'm creating stuff that's entertaining, but also inclusive. So I'm my own audience. And so if I like it, then I know that there are other people that you know share my similar experiences out there that like it. Like Michelle Obama says, Obama says, I'm from the South side of Chicago and that tells you everything you need to know about me. But it's also so many layers and growing up a black gay man and black gay boy on the South side of Chicago who went to a great school, the same school as Michelle Obama, by the way. Um, you know what I mean? Whitney Young. And, but all of that and being a nerd, but then also being in the drama club and also being friends with the jocks and all of that, you know what I mean? And so I, I tend to create what I I want to see and make it fun, you know, and I always say, you know, a little bit, of, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I, I create the narratives. And it's usually about whether or not I would watch it. Mm. Brittany, how about for you? Uh, I don't recall ever seeing anyone on TV or film that was, yeah, I just never had that like, oh, that's me moment. Um, and I think even now, I try not to operate with the assumption that like what I am doing is something that everyone needs. I think that like people are gonna relate to it. Everything isn't for everyone, but for that specific need or desire that certain folks have to see themselves on TV, like I can provide that. And I don't know that the narrative or what the story actually is trumps that. I think that if that is something that like makes you open your eyes and makes you go like, oh, I can, I, there are roles for me. There are writing jobs that I can do. Like just having that box opened, I think does so much because it truly just never even occurred to me. And I think that it is partially true that like, you know, even a few years ago, the amount of roles that are available to folks like us, it, it keeps growing. Uh, so that's, it's one thing to be like, you know, this was true, but there's a brighter future for us. And like, please come fight with us for, for something that we all like want to happen. 
Absolutely. Kat, I see you nodding along as well over there. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of, I like doing what I do because I remember what it was like to be a young kid who literally couldn't imagine what their future would be, you know? Um, and I, I still feel like there aren't a ton of people like myself on YouTube. Um, and that's the way that a lot of kids especially are, you know, coming up like YouTube is part of the way that a lot of people are digesting media and, and getting to know themselves these days. So I, I like to stay on YouTube because I want to be able to be that person that I couldn't imagine myself when I was a younger kid. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, like that's, that's one of the biggest things that drives me. Yeah. Clay, what drives you? Uh, when, when thinking about growing up, I mean, like everybody's saying there was nothing there, but I remember, I think it was, 95 or 96, I saw a film called Tongues United by Marlon Riggs, who passed away in 1994. And that was a documentary about black gay folks. And I can recall sitting in the theater uh, and I saw a black gay couple holding hands. And I had never seen that. I'm from Philly. I had never seen that whatsoever. So I remember that having a huge impact on me. And I often wonder, I wonder how that would have impacted me if I would have saw that when I was younger. But it was just, it was massive. And Tongues, you know, United was just, there was nudity. It was about love and sex. It was unapologetic. And that was, that was really, that was massive for me. That really changed my life and changed my perspective um, on, uh, on just how we, on how we, we look at ourselves and how we, we, we present ourselves. And then for me, I mean, uh, I did a doc from BET called Holler, If You Hear Me, Black and Gay in the Church. And uh, at the time, a lot of folks weren't really talking about spiritual and theological violence in the uh, in the uh, black church. And uh, I thought of I thought of Tongues United, and um, BET gave me complete control. Uh, I was able to do anything I wanted. I was so grateful. I had folks there advocating for me to tell that story. Every edit, every cut was all was all was all um, was all me. So uh, yeah, it was that. I mean, and a lot of folks don't remember. Uh, Marlon Riggs enough, he's not mentioned enough, but it was really, really powerful. And so I can only imagine young people today uh, seeing, you know, Pose or seeing Legendary and seeing us beyond reality show sidekicks, seeing us beyond being these tragic people in the closet, seeing us beyond being chronically ill. I mean, wow, seeing us beyond our trauma, you know, we're not just trauma. Uh, there's this line by Zora Neale Hurston I live by, I am not tragically colored. And I always say I'm not tragically black or gay. So, uh, yeah. Amen. Uh, Maisie, I'm coming to you to you to follow that up. <laughs> no pressure. No, I just wanted to add, I completely agree with everyone. So just to also add the other side of it, of something I'm conscious of with the films that I personally create is also that for a lot of people out there, these films are their only direct intimate experience of meeting someone of color or meeting a LGBTQ plus person. Um, and so I'm really careful of, I, I personally am a big believer in positive diverse representation, not just diverse representation. And I think the more personal we go with our stories, actually the more universal they become. Um, and so really diving deeper and deeper into, into, into who and what and how and why. Um, and through that, hoping that people will actually be able to relate more to it, no matter what your background or experience or sexuality, um, and hoping to breed some kind of love beyond just tolerance um, through vulnerably and honestly presenting people with people who look different to them. The thing that I love so much about this panel is the idea that all six of you are, are such incredibly accomplished um, in, in your field, but also it feels like it's just the beginning of what you're all able to do. When it comes to kind of those big dreams um, and those spaces that you wanna to continue to move into, if you could just, you know, very narrowly, I guess maybe not narrowly, but more succinctly um, share, you know, those kind of future aspirations, I would love for people to start to think about what you want to do next. Um, what is what is the big dream, if you will? Um, Elegance, I see a big smile there from you. I'm just smiling because you're, I love I love your moderation. You're so good at oh. this. Um, of course. 
For me, I, I just started my production company. It's called Freedom Principle. Our first project is Peer Kids. Our next project is The Inspection. Uh, and The Inspection is a story about a homeless kid who joins the Marine Corps to change his life, but then has to conceal his attraction to his drill instructor in order to survive boot camp. The movie is set during 2005, the Inner Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and the Iraq War. Um, so that's the next thing I'm working on, amongst a few other things. I have a, a TV show about the Black history. Basically, it's Tongues Untied meets um, How to Survive a Plague. And it's about the Black contribution towards the fight against HIV and AIDS um, that I'm making with Danya R. Love. We're also doing a show with uh, George Johnson for uh, All the Ways Aren't Blue. Um, amongst other projects. So in the future, what I want to do is I want to be like my heroes. I want to be like the Lee Daniels is of the world and the Martin Scorsese's and the Pedro Almodovar's and Stanley Kubrick's and make really daring, cinematically brilliant documentary films and television and narrative fiction films and television so that I can contribute something to make the world a more uh, intelligent and uh, beautiful place. Absolutely. Speak all that into the universe. That's what that's what we want to hear here. Um, Brittany, going to you next. Uh, you know, the, the tension of success or becoming like a, a big deal in this industry is something that has always sort of plagued me. Um, like the movie that I made, Suicide Kale, was made completely out of the system. We did it completely independently. Um, and I think it's a function of how the system works. Uh, there's so much of we have a black thing or we have a queer thing or we have a black and queer thing. So that's enough. Um, and I have never, I don't wanna be someone who is keeping other people out because I'm in. I don't wanna be someone that like, if you all of a sudden have me as an EP or some work is attached to me, then that's people's ways to get into the door. I would rather try to figure out ways to break those doors down. Uh, like a quote that I really enjoy is the role of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. And I think that so many people do that in front of the camera and it's time that people start doing that behind the scenes too, because stuff like working conditions and all the things that we've talked about are super important. So just trying to navigate this uh, <laughs> situation as, as best as I can, as close to like who I am, who I'm trying to be morally and uh, taking up space in this world in a way that makes me feel good. Yes, yes. Kat, over to you. Oof, I'm still figuring out what I want to be when I grow up. Um, <laughs> Hurt me all. <laughs> I mean, I have so many plans and so many dreams. I'm a very creative person. I kind of, um, I've been thinking of writing a book and I'm thinking of making a TV show based on said book. I have a lot of ideas, a lot of things. I just want to be able to control my, my stuff more and produce more and produce at a higher quality. And so I want to be able to not be a Virgo and learn how to delegate and, you know, grow and things. Cause I've been told that if your dream is too, is too small that only you can do it, you can't grow. So I've been trying to, to do that. Well, one thing we know that we will continue to get is more just incredible conversations and provocative uh, just just the way that you tell stories through your content, you know, it, it is is just, I think, like you said, an, an opportunity for these young people, especially young people watching you on YouTube to be able to, you know, ask these kinds of questions and, and learn these things that they wouldn't otherwise. So that is yeah. something we will be looking forward to. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, for you. Yeah, so, you know, it's actually a good question because it's a question I've been personally dealing with for the last couple of years. Um, you know, as a producer and content creator, I've been doing this for a, a long while and I made the switch and transition, maybe the transition is a better word, to writer, director, when I was 37 and so, or 38. And so for me, it was reconciling that I've already been a success. I've already achieved a lot of success and really internalizing that 
in, in myself because, you know, when it's you, you think, well, I haven't done all the things that I want to do. I haven't become Spielberg yet. You know, I, I haven't, you know, done all these things. Um, and then, re you know, really reconciling that I've already been a success. But now to piggyback on both what Clay said and then also what Elegant said is that continuing to own my power and not in by owning my power, encouraging other queer filmmakers to own their power, that you can do whatever you want. You don't have to wait for the gatekeeper. When you know that you are powerful and worthy of, of what your vision and your dream is, you can do anything and there's nothing that can stop you. And using that same elevation that I've had in my personal life and understanding to have the global presence that my work and my talent deserves. So I want the world to know about Nathan Hale Williams and my projects. So that's where we're going. Um, and so I'm creating, a, I've created a show based on my novel, uh, Ladies Who Lunch and Love. I'm doing a documentary called Native Son, uh, chronicling the history of black queer men in America and our, you know, having to straddle the gay community and the black community and, uh, and just more work that's fun, entertaining and uplifting on a global scale. Yeah. And Maisie, for you. Um, well, I, it's funny because for me, directing is, if it, it fills my whole body, whereas writing is more of a challenge to me. So I really want to challenge myself to, to sit down and, and write and finish this feature that I've been brewing in my mind for about 10 years now, which is based on something which I haven't seen before, which is loosely based on my own experiences of coming out and being queer and a young POC within London specifically, um, and the scene that was very specific to that time, um, which has remained pretty much undocumented. Um, so I'm really excited to explore that. Um, and really building out Bareface Productions, because the whole point of it is to provide a platform eventually, to provide platform and resources for other marginalized filmmakers, artists, musicians, so that we can actually maintain their creative autonomy and creative control and creative dreams without having to sacrifice or sell or you know give anything away in order to get it to be made um it's not about the money it's about the art and i think to have a safe space to create like that is hard to come by and i would love to help make a space like that thank you and last clay when it comes to expanding your dreams and and also you know providing that 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 inspiration to that next generation where do you want to go next well i gotta say quickly when i was quoting uh talking about marlon riggs i said tongues united i meant tongues untied forgive me i'm sure marlon was like reading from the heavens so, so forgive me You're <laughs> it's been a long day but i was on radio for two hours but tongues untied make sure y'all watch it um, your tongue was tied it's exactly. okay we understand this is live this is exactly forgive me <laughs> uh so i um i have so many projects that, that i'm working on uh, so many things that are up in the air. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, there, another quote. Uh, there's another line that I live by, and it's by James Baldwin. And he says, you have to go the way your blood beats. You have to go the way your blood beats. So as long as I go in that, that direction, as long as anybody else watching goes in that direction, uh, you're on the right path. I sometimes say you have to go the way your blood boils. But either one. So... That's the way that my spirit, my soul, and my heart goes. And as long as I stay on that path, I feel like um, my heart is right. It's the Clay, it's the Clay Kane remix of James Baldwin. I like that. Exactly. Everybody oh, put your own spin on it. And I can DJ. I do miss DJing, so maybe I'll, I'll be spinning somewhere. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for your time, for a little bit of conversation about your journey and we, of course, look forward to seeing all of these steps that you continue to make in your careers and also in inspiring uh, others to fight for their dreams. So thank you to Elegance Bratton, to Nathan Hale Williams, to Brittany Nichols, to Pat Black, to Clay Kane, and to Maisie Richardson Sellers. And thank you to the audience. I'm Angelique Jackson. Continue enjoying um, all of the programming from Frameline 45.